So in this talk, I'm going to talk about publishing complex features with, uh, with GeoServer with uh, uh, an accent on Inspire compliance, but literally about any sort of complex feature publishing. So first of all, a shout out to my company, GeoSolutions, for sending me here. Uh, GeoSolutions is based in, in, uh, in Italy with uh, an office in the United States. We support a number of open source projects. We are core developers in them. We can provide you with uh, support, uh, custom development, bug fixing, and so on, and make sure that whatever you ask us to do goes back into the open source project. We are uh, at the core about openness and open source and open standards. And uh, with this, I can start talking about Inspire. <laughs> so Inspire support in, Geo in GeoServer. GeoServer supports Inspire from a couple of angles. First of all, Inspire uh, recommends the usage of OGC services, and GeoServer implements uh, most, of, most of the ones that are needed for uh, data delivery, map viewing. Uh, there is also support for discovery through CSW if you want. And uh, there is a dedicated Inspire extension that you can install to add a bunch of extra metadata into the capabilities document so that you have uh, supported languages uh, and uh, data set indicators and so on. Um, in particular, when you are publishing vector data uh, targeting the Inspire compliance, you should be publishing uh, complex features. So the, the, the GML that, is, that you need to generate is not a flat list of attributes, but it's a complex tree of information properly organized and uh, um, defined in advance by the Inspire specification itself. So you have a, a target application schema, uh, so an XML schema that you have to abide to, and you have your input structure in your database, and we have a plugin called Application Schema that is designed to uh, map between whatever is your source information in your internal organization and the output model that you need to generate. And so everything goes through a bunch of mapping files that describe how to go from A to B, for out from uh, your internal structure to the actual complex output. So for example, in the, uh, say that I have a very simple situation with stations, observ observations, and observed parameters, classic, very simple model, then the, um, the, the mapping file would allow me to turn this relational database into that XML that we have in, in the slide. Uh, setting up the, the mapping can be a, a difficult experience, so if uh, you uh, want, there is a visual editor compatible with, with Hale 3.5 uh, that allows you to basically create the mapping by sort of dragging and dropping the information uh, from the source structure into the target one, and it would generate the, the mapping files for you. And uh, this is more or less how it looks. So as you can see, input, output, dragging, creating connections. Now, um, this has been working, but the process is complicated, it's actually daunting. So we started looking into uh, new approaches. So uh, again, starting from this relational mapping model that, that we have, how do we make in, it into a, a publishable complex model? What are the moving parts in this? Well, I have my original data storage, my relational database, or whatever it is. It doesn't have to be relational databases, but it's the most common scenario. And on the other end, I have my data model that I need to uh, abide to. It can be an, uh, an XML schema or a UML, a UML model, and actually normally people start from the UML model and then they create the XML schema. Um, and this is used to reach to a, a, a given output structure, which is a complex GML abiding to the uh, application schema or an equivalent complex GeoJSON. This is done through uh, the application schema uh, structure, which provides all the internal data mapping. It's building the features. It's turning them into GML. And it's also dealing with all sorts of querying uh, problems, because we have an external model. Uh, the filters are expressed to uh, the external model. They have to be mapped back onto the original structure. So app schema has to work both ways mapping towards the output, but also mapping the filters back to the original structure. This is really complicated. Uh, we have a, an, an XML mapping file that, well, defines what goes where and how to map back and forth the information. And uh, 
generally speaking, in order to use the application schema plugin, uh, you need, first of all, an application schema to target. So what if I just wanted to publish some information that doesn't have an already available application schema, that doesn't have an already available complex uh, XML schema? I have to b build one. That's kind of a hefty ticket to pay in order to publish a complex information. It's just too hard for many, and not everyone actually needs to target a well-known shared uh, schema. They just want to publish complex features. So we tried to divide the, the, um, the problem in two parts, one that is just data mapping and the other that is abiding to a certain output structure. The Smart Data Loader plugin, which is a community module, is a plugin that allows you to take your uh, database with your relation, uh, relational structure and figure out a suitable complex model for it automatically without having to write um, an, an application schema in advance. It does it for you. And uh, by using this, you are already basically mimicking the, st the structure of the database and coming out with a valid complex GML or a valid complex GeoJSON without having to write a single line of XML schema. If the output uh, is not suitable for your uh, consumption, for whatever reason, then we have features templating that can take that output and map it into whatever complex GeoJSON, complex uh, XML, or HTML representation you would like. So we basically split the two parts into two separate plugins. So the idea, if you are doing the whole dance, uh, is that you have your uh, relational database, you attach a smart data loader, the smart data loader figures out the structure and generates valid OGC services and OGC APIs for you already. If you are not uh, happy with the structure, then you can customize through feature templating. Let's have a look at it with a little bit more detail. So in Smart Data Loader, as I said, it's a community module. I go in and say, OK, I wanted to create a new Smart Data Loader data store. Uh, I'm going to take my, uh, my structure from uh, an existing PostgreSQL database. And uh, then it's going to ask me, OK, I have this 25 table. What is the root entity of your model? So which table contains the, 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 the center of the structure? And then it's going to crawl all the foreign keys and figure out the parent, uh, parent child relationships and come up with uh, a little nice tree for you. You choose which parts you would like to publish and which parts not. And it generates an application schema mapping for you. So under cover, it still uses application schema, but it's all automatic. And um, right, I already said this. Once you decide on the, the root entity and which parts you want to publish, then it's going to tell you, oh, OK, uh, I've created an application schema mapping, and these are the entities that I found. I have the root one, but there are also the satellite ones. Which ones do you want to publish? You go, click on Publish, and you already have your valid complex GML ready for consumption. And so this is one example of going out directly with the, the GML or with the, the complex GeoJSON mapped straight out of your data, database structure. If what you get is not exactly what you want it, uh, I mean, uh, it could be that you, you can stop there. If it's, if it's for your internal consumption, for your application, you might not need to do any, any extra mapping. But if you need to abide to any target structure for whatever reason, or you just don't like the names of what's coming out and so on, then you can install feature templating. Feature templating is a system that's based on templates. So you basically edit directly the complex GeoJSON, the JSON LD, or the, the GML as an example with interpolation with the placeholders. And uh, so that's one valid GML document and one valid JSON document that you can just use a, as an example. And uh, so coming back to our use case, uh, I can have a, um, a stations template working like this. So this is by itself a valid uh, JSON document. It validates as, as pure valid JSON. It's just that in some of the strings, you can see interpolations, placeholders, like ID, position, common name, and so on. In some parts, you see me concatenating multiple uh, attributes or static elements with attributes. There is a str uh, concat here 
that puts together a prefix with a, with a property. And uh, here I'm, uh, probably because I'm trying to do some uh, JSON-LD, I'm also turning a, a geometry into WKT, and, uh, and so on. And uh, here I have another concatenation of another concatenation, and so on. So I can do uh, a small amount of, of logic and, and expressions in there. But basically, what I see here is what I'm gonna get, and in fact, this is an example of how it comes out. So we can see that uh, the uh, identifier has been replaced with the, the original data. My geometry has been turned into a valid GeoJSON geometry. And all the interpolations here have been expanded and turned into one or more uh, items. In, in this case, uh, uh, I actually have here this source tag saying observations. When I use that, I mean that I'm working over an array and the source is gonna be expanded for every item it has, applying the template over and over. Um, the template can be done for uh, three languages now, XML, JSON, and uh, HTML. And uh, um, I have an editor where I can type in the template and, uh, and then I can uh, try to preview it against my data to see how it comes out. So I have a sort of an interactive uh, uh, environment in which I do a little change, I try it out, see how it comes out, and uh, iterate until I'm happy with the result. And uh, as I said, I can do this for, for GeoJSON, I can do this for GML, I can do it for JSON-LD, which is just another variation of, of JSON, and I can do it for HTML output. Which template do I use? Well, I can, um, I can do some contextual template lookup, so I can say, oh, if the service was WMS and the operation was get feature info, then use this template, and if the, instead the, the request was WFS, then use that template and so on. So I can have different templates for the same feature type be used depending on which service and which operation I'm running. Um, so for example, for get feature info, I most likely want something flat because most of the uh, clients of WMS would have a hard time understanding complex, deeply nested JSON output, but if I'm doing J, um, WFS instead or, or GCFEI features, then I can go complex because the client is most likely able to cope with that. Use cases uh, highlights for, uh, for this application. Uh, they are typically research institutes. Um, so the first one is BRGM, Le uh, Bureau de la Recherche Geologique et Minéraire in France. Um, they, are, they have a, um, a large database of boreholes available through WFS 2.0 and OGC API, and they wanted to have both GeoJSON and JSON-LD outputs available for everyone, uh, and uh, also have a variation of complex and simple representation of the, the same data. And so we, we prepared for them a templated JSON-LD output, which uh, has, uh, uh, as you can see, some uh, uh, 2 WKT expansion as well, because in, in JSON, uh, well, in JSON-LD, you, you cannot have arrays of arrays. That's the limit of the, the JSON-LD specification, which means you cannot represent the JSON geometries. You have to turn them into text. And, uh, well, the, the templating mechanism has functions to do just that. And, uh, well, this, this is an example going from the, uh, the template to the uh, resulting JSON-LD. Um, another nice thing about uh, uh, feature templating that I didn't mention before is that just like app schema, it can map back and forth. So the fact that the, that the, um, the template is actually a valid GML document or a valid JSON means that we can not just run it blindly without understanding what it does, but we understand the structure so we can do back mapping. So when people tell me, Ah, I wanted to uh, find uh, all the, the borehole whose uh, length is uh, greater than 83, just to throw at you a random filter, then I can go and say, oh, okay, wait, 
the expressions that I used to build that uh, length come from the original model in this property with this particular interpolation. Then I can build a filter against it. And then application schema or smart data loader is gonna make, map it back again to the original database. Long story short, even if I have this two levels of mapping, I'm still hitting the database with a filter, rather than you know loading everything and filtering in memory, which is key for efficiency. And uh, this back mapping works for whatever language I'm supporting. Another example that we have is an uh, NPRA, the Datex2 use case. Uh, NPRA is the Norwegian Public Road Administration, and they have this uh, complex uh, Datex2 uh, data store that they, they then wanted to map out uh, from using GeoJSON and WMS and WFS. And this is a kind of a different use case because they didn't go through a smart data loader and then feature templating. They already have a complex model stored in MongoDB as complex JSON documents that just doesn't match what they want to have in output. <laughs> and so feature templating is, is doing that from complex to complex, basically. And uh, also in that case, we can map back to the original MongoDB structure and throw the filter at MongoDB. Another use case that I don't have a slide for it, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning, is the GeoServer Stack API. Yes. The GeoServer Stack API uh, is designed to work against our uh, relational Postgres database, which was born to support uh, um, open search for EO, not for Stack. And so how do we build the complex JSON that is representing the collections, the items, the assets, and so on, through feature templating? And that also allows us to have a database structure which is freeform, or relatively freeform. I can just go and add extra attributes into it. GeoServer recognizes them, allows me to map them through uh, feature templating, and there I have it, them in the output. So if I wake up tomorrow and I want to add the support for an extra stack extension in my data set, I just add the necessary columns in my data set, modify my templates, and there I go, I have my extra um, extension support for Stack API with full querying support, just out of it. And that's it. Questions? Can you also build the schema from the database structure where you've got foreign key relationships, you know, multiple, you know, structures in the database without having to define your mapping? Sure. I mean, that's what uh, the smart data loader does. The smart data loader per se is basically uh, automating the creation of an application schema uh, from the structure of the database. It crawls through the foreign keys, figures out what the parent-child uh, relationships are, or the many-to-many, -many, and it generates a corresponding uh, XML schema for me. If I'm not happy with what has been generated, I can just copy the, the, the schemas that have been generated by application schema, sorry, the, by smart data loader, throw away the smart data loader uh, store, and just use an, a traditional application schema. So I, I could use it as a generator mm -hmm. and then just tweak the schema, and uh, tweak the mapping file, and there I go with application schema. So this store is literally, at the same time, a store, but also an application schema mapping generator. Got it. Makes sense. Thanks, Andrea, for the presentation. Great work. Um, well, as you know, I work uh, also on Inspire. Um, in the last few years, we try to simplify the, the complex nature of GML, uh, also for obvious reasons that that was somehow the default at the beginning of Inspire, but the, uh, the, the capability of clients to consume data, of course, is limited. So we um, created some encoding rules that move from uh, the complex schemas to GeoJSON to GeoPackage. I was just one. wondering to, to better understand, um, do you already consider those, or it is up to the user to define the template based on what we call the, the good practices? So these EUML to GeoJSON, uh, for example, encoding rules. So I can answer you in two ways, two examples. Uh, one is that we, um, last year we did an activity with GeoNovum 
to make GeoServer better comply with OGC API features and the like, and they wanted to have uh, the addresses uh, data set be published according to the new GeoJSON flat representation. And for that case, we had a very simple geo package that already had the columns that would map directly to the desired GeoJSON, so no mapping involved. The data uh, structure in the geo package wasn't exactly pretty because you, you know you, you have the, all those underscore one, underscore two, and so on uh, attributes in, in, uh, in the output, but it required no extra effort. It was just you know, going directly from database to GeoJSON. In the case of uh, BRGM, instead, they wanted to have a JSON-LD properly structured to be complex. But at the same time, they wanted to have the flat uh, Inspire compliant structure. And so the database was the relational one with all the foreign keys and blah, blah, blah. And uh, the, um, they applied the general rules for flattening the, um, the JSON. And we had a GeoJSON template that uh, was producing flat and a JSON-LD template that was producing nested. And they had to write the, the template in that case. More questions? 